So last week we were in the third discourse. Remember, five blocks of teaching, clearly distinguished, paralleling the Torah, the five books of Moses, because Matthew, as a Jew, is writing to the audience's Jewish Christians, mainly. So there is a lot of parallels to the Old Testament and things that relate to Judaism, which we may or may not understand this morning. So in chapter 13, there were seven parables, seven, about the kingdom of heaven. Just to catch us up, and you can go back and read if you haven't already, Jesus went back to Nazareth. He was not welcome there. Prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Um, Herod killed John the Baptist. Jesus fed 5,000. He walked on water. And Peter did also for a while until he doubted and began to sink in fear. Chapter 15, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and scribes for their misinterpretation of the scriptures again. A Canaanite woman's daughter is healed. That's a pretty big deal. And then Jesus feeds 4,000 men in Gentile territory. So you see already the, the plan. We're not just going to the Jews. We're, we're already touching beyond. Uh, chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees gang up together. That's, a, that's two groups that do not like each other, but they just want to get Jesus out of the way. So they demand that sign, right? And Jesus says, a wicked generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah, right? So now that's a short summary of where we're coming into this morning. And it's Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not conquer it or overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. That's a hard thing to do. Caesarea Philippi, a pagan city. They're in a, a, a pagan city expanded by Herod Philip, named after a Greek god, uh, Pan. Just picture this little dude with horns and a, a little flute, Satan-looking dude, woodland deity, and there was a shrine there, and they call it Pan's Grotto, so that's the area we're, we're in, but what's not there, only ruins are there, are a temple for worshiping Caesar, towering above them, so and this is on the site, this illustration. There's the, the, the cave place there, and then the, the place to worship Caesar. These are huge monumental buildings. So you just give you a picture of where they were standing in the midst of all this idolatry. It's a place for sacrificing goats or something over there. Uh, it's probably, I think that's Zeus, a temple for Zeus. All, all kinds of craziness. And what's going on in there? You don't want me to tell you this morning, but it's sick. 
So in the midst of all this, out of all places, to, to have one of the climaxes of this book take place, Jesus asks a question to his disciples about what the word on the street is, who people think that he is. But he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is important. Especially in the book of Matthew. Nine times before this it's used, before this moment, and then 20 times from now to the end. So remember, if if things are repeated like that, pay attention. Something's going on there. Matthew is stressing, of course, the kingdom from a Jewish perspective. The Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It reads, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's what Son of Man means. It's a designation for the Messiah. Now, only Jesus called himself this. The disciples didn't call him that. It's it's the fulfillment of the the Jewish understanding of the Messiah. And we have to gain that understanding by reading the Bible and maybe learning a little bit of history because otherwise you're like, okay, son of man, what does that mean? When Jesus called himself the son of man, it made the religious Jews furious, very angry. Because they expected the Son of Man to come in dominion, visible dominion and power. It was an offense to them that Jesus came the way he did. Working miracles and and, and preaching radical things, yes, but lowly in humility and serving and, and not in a kingly, wealthy, politically powered fashion. They expected really an an apocalyptic warrior, like something you see in the movies. So, Simon answers, of course, first. Some say John the Baptist and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And that's because just like today, people had some bizarre end times expectations And in this case, referring to the identity of the Messiah. John the Baptist had been thought to be risen from the dead, right? By Herod. Elijah, that's from Malachi 4.5. They had expected Elijah to come before the Messiah. So if Elijah hadn't come, what? and you're you're the Messiah, what's going on? And then... Jeremiah, and that's, that's from scrolls written in between the Testaments, and it talks about Isaiah and Jeremiah coming to help beforehand. So these are things that they expected. No one was thinking that Jesus was the Messiah at that time. To them, he was just another prophet or another one to come before the real king, before the real deal. but not his disciples. So Jesus, Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers in this moment of greatness, <laughs> even though right after this he's going to fail again, and then he's going to fail again, as he has before. But hey, at least he was growing. I love, I love reading about Peter because he's, he's strong and then you see his lapses of reason and it makes me not feel as bad. 
the, 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 the people that God, God uses, that Jesus chose, it wasn't the, the ones who had it all together. So he's growing. And here we, we see a spiritual growth because he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The son of the living God. Christ means anointed one, Messiah. And then he says, son of the living God. And that's another clue to where they were. When the Jews saw all these other gods around them, the, the stone statues and all this, their, their thing was to say, well, um, we serve a living God, not these dead cold stone objects and saying this publicly right here in Roman controlled area there were dead gods all around them or, or demonic things like Caesar worship who actually had and I, we put it up here the title on the coins says well, it says, Son of God. It's right there. Roman coins had the graven image of Caesar Augustus, and a caption on the coin read, Son of God. And it was believed by Romans that Augustus, the first of the Roman empires, was divinely conceived by a serpent as August, Augustus' mother lay asleep in the temple of Apollo. Wow, that's some twisted stuff. So they saw him as, so he's saying, he's saying this, no, no, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, not whatever's going on there. What's with the coin? What's with the son? What's, what is with all these statues and monuments? And, uh, you know, it's, it's in what we do today. And as far as idolatry, it's because human beings, we always want to try to create a connection with the divine. We, we have created ways to attempt to do that ourselves. The problem is our way is the sinful way and it doesn't work because Christ is the only way. So Peter gets the title right, but he's, he's still, he's still going to struggle because he has, has a wrong idea of how the Messiah is going to come. <laughs> Or continue, because right after this, he's going to forbid Jesus to go suffer on the cross. Because he's expecting, well, you can't die. You have to conquer. But the grace of God. So we see the disciples gradually opening their eyes to the reality of who Jesus is. And isn't that what discipleship is? We're, we're getting to know him, and we're gradually opening our eyes because there's a lot of things for us that we don't we expect and doesn't happen in our Christian lives. And getting to know him is the key. Getting to know his identity. They walk with him. They've seen his deeds, they've heard his words. They've seen his authority and power over nature, over creation, over sickness, over death. And that's revelation. That's, that's through the whole Bible. It's God revealing himself to those who will follow him. You follow him, he's going to reveal himself to you. And you don't have to try to find a connection with the divine in the myriad of ways that we have today. Our lives... And our actions as followers of Christ are going to reveal the answer to the question, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? And, and we have something, we have a bonus now. We have, we have the whole story. We have the whole revelation. We have the whole Everything that they didn't. We, have, we know that Jesus died and rose from the dead. We know that he suffered. We know that he's, what he's called us to. 
And then we know what is leading up to the end. And we know who wins. But even with this revelation, with the word of God, which we have a huge illiteracy crisis on our hands, biblically, even crowds today out there, they, they think that Jesus is just the thing you talk about at Christmas and Easter, right? I mean, or, I, I mean, I remember, I remember thinking, well, that's just like that, it's like a relic on a, on a cross in, in my two years of Catholic school. That's all I thought. It's like some kind of religious thing. I don't know. Jesus? I mean, many Christians today still think like in those ancient times, and I don't have the statistics, but it's overwhelming the amount of professing Christians that believe that Jesus is just a teacher or was just another guru or another prophet or another self-help book on the shelf of Barnes and Noble that's going to help us make our lives much better. And these are Christians. He is Messiah. The promised king who fully God, fully man, died and rose again to bring his kingdom to power. And then Jesus said, so Peter's proclaiming this. It's, it's, it's awesome. So he gets a blessing. He says, you are blessed. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, and you didn't learn it from any human being. So that's telling us that was, that was a divine thing. And then he calls him, calls him Simon, son of Jonah, which is interesting parallel considering if you look how many verses before this. Thirteen verses earlier, Jesus mentioned the sign of Jonah. You think that's an accident? That just happened to be there the only time that he calls him that. Remember Jonah and the big fish, Sunday school stuff? Who is Jonah? He was called to preach to the Ninevites, didn't want to because he thought they deserved wrath. Called to be a preacher, uh, had a wake-up call with the, with the fish and all that, but still stubborn. Now Peter's about to be called to preach to a people who he has to get past a lot of prejudices and biases because he thinks they deserve wrath. And, and then for the first time in, in, in the Bible... For the first time in the Bible, we see the word church this morning, and that's where we're going. We see the word church. I also say to you that you are Peter. There's a name change there. That's important. There's a turning point. Whenever that happens in the Bible, it's a big deal. Abraham, Sarah, uh, Paul, uh, Jacob. So, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And the message would come from a church, an ecclesia is, is the word, and it's basically just an assembly of believers. But this verse has a lot of controversy as far as uh, Peter being the rock. But Jesus is simply using a play on words. Peter, Petros, mean, means rock. Rock is, rock is Petra. And I've heard a lot of interesting ways to figure this out, but they're both just rock. And back then, they would have used those words interchangeably for rock. So, so we, have a, we have a, I guess maybe a dilemma, but it's not really. So the Catholics took this too far to make Peter the man, the Pope, right? And give all that authority to him and all that power. 
And then Protestants, we get super upset about that. Oh my goodness, how could they do that? Well, they're wrong to have made him a pope. But they're not totally off as far as Peter being influential and special here. We don't worship Peter, but he is special, just like anyone else in the Bible who has had a tremendous change. We respect them, and God's put them on a special mission. So Jesus, of course, is our firm foundation, but you have to pay attention to the words, which I think we read too fast. I know I do, so I always have to go back over and over and read. Jesus does not say, you are Peter, you are Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. He says, and on this rock, I'll build my church. Jesus' teaching is the ultimate foundation for our lives, of course. But you have to understand that Peter functions as a part of that foundation rock, just like the apostles and the prophets. He's part of it. it, it it's in the confession of his message that, that the church is going to be built on. Ultimately, Jesus, yes, but Peter has a part in that. Ephesians 2.20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So I'll say there is something special about Peter. At Pentecost, he's the first one to, to bring that message, preaching the kingdom to that assembly, that gathering that's built on Jesus Christ, right? Doesn't mean that we're Peter's church. Remember, Jesus clears that up anyway. He says, You're gonna, it's my church. This is his church. This isn't our church or an assembly of whatever church. This is, this is his church. He established it on the confession of ordinary fishermen and sinners saved by grace. Isn't that awesome? Who had a life-changing, transforming, powerful testimony from our foundation. And it's through those transformations, it's through the testimonies and the proclamation and repentance in there, of course, that Jesus says, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Hades. Um, sure, some of your translations say hell. Also death. Death and hell can't overcome the kingdom of God, basically. And like Kyle was alluding to earlier, the, the, the church, we are actually an offensive weapon in the kingdom to the, to the powers of darkness. And, you know, a seminary professor taught me that gates are a defensive weapon. Have you ever thought about that? It's the last line of defense when you are in a city and an army is about to invade. What are you going to do? You're going to cower behind a gate because it's a defensive weapon. Just hoping they do not get in. And whose gates are these in this verse? Hell's gates. Hades. It's the enemy's gates. And as, as believers, we do. We act like we're the ones cowering behind gates. That's not the church that Jesus built. The message of the kingdom, even this morning, it's invading enemy territories and conquering. The proclamations of, of the message of the kingdom. All the enemy can do is cower behind the gate, basically, and the gate is never going to be held up. It's going to be destroyed. It's already written. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 14. So Jesus says, I'll, get, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So keys, not physical keys. That's delegated authority. Delegated authority, and it's authorizing Peter and followers of Christ to actually admit or deny people into the kingdom of God. 
That's, that's powerful. That's, that's a lot of authority. Whose authority is it, though? It's Jesus' authority. We're just, it's delegated, so we're working on, it, on his behalf. We're authorized as the church to usher people into the kingdom of God. Now think about that, what that means, and this is, the big, this is like the start of where we're going as far as the church. That, that should make us take being a part of a church a little bit more seriously than coming every Sunday to get our fill of theological knowledge and then walking out a little smarter, biblically. This is people's lives. The authority to touch people's lives has been delegated to a body, a community of believers. And it started with Peter. Remember at this time, religious Jews, what were they doing with their, their places? They were shutting people out. Matthew 23, 13 says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, <laughs> nor do you allow those who are entering in. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the keys. They shut people out. And they're not even in it themselves because they're hypocrites. We don't shut people out. The whole purpose of the church is to set, see, set, people, uh, set people free. See people set free. That's captives, those enslaved in bondage, in sin, in the depths, right? Well, which people? All people? Yeah, all people. That's the commission of the church. That's why we're here. That's why the church exists. In the power that he gave Peter and the church, I'm, the, the keys, the, the power unlocked everything. And here's what it did. Here's what those keys did. And, and we see the unlocking. And that happens in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So there's three specific times where Peter unlocks, opens the door for the message of the kingdom to go forward on the next slide. There it is. Acts chapter 2. Jerusalem to the Jews, Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, Simon the sorcerer, Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles with Cornelius. Every time, that's the unlocking that happened, and the message is going forth. Peter unlocked it first. That's why he's got some, some cred, some street cred, not making him a pope. That's just, that's just not right, right? That's too much power for one person. It's really dangerous. And we continue to proclaim this message. And what this message does is it shuts people out, not that we want them out, but for those that receive it, it's gonna allow, they're, they're gonna come in. For those who rebel against it, it's gonna close them off. That's how it works. It's a double-edged sword. If we repent, the kingdom of heaven, we enter in. So then he goes into the binding and loosing. And this is controversial, I guess, until I actually started reading the Bible in context. I used the NSB this morning because it's a very literal translation, and it'll be different than some of yours. But the verb tenses in the Greek are, are different than we might think. And it makes a big difference. So they maybe could have translated it better. But it says, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound, and then shall have been bound again. So, in heaven. So that's basically meaning what you're permitting, 
are things that are already allowed or not allowed by God. These terms, we're looking in the Jewish context, they come from rabbis, and it was the authority that they had as teachers of the law to determine what's clean or not unclean. They had that power. It was called binding and loosing. They had the the authority to declare what is lawful or not lawful. Here with Peter, he's giving him that rabbi-like authority to permit or resist things or keep things out while forming the early church. And we see that come out in, um, in his vision with, with what's clean and unclean, right? There's, a new, there's, a new, there's new things about that. We have to set some boundaries here as far as what to eat and all that. Certain things are clean and unclean. He's giving Peter and ultimately the church the authority for that. Binding and loosing also is permitting or forbidding things to happen in the context of church discipline. And that's about all the context is. That opens up to the apostles later, and that's in Matthew 18, which is something the modern church has gotten gravely wrong as far as church discipline, I'd say. And I'm I'm probably, I don't know, Lord help me, am I even doing it right? Because when you're a body of of, of, a body of believers um, fellowshipping and uh, united and worshiping the Lord, we're, we're community and out of love, there's times where we have to address things that are not so comfortable, right? And in, in our day and age, we, we have the mentality, it's individualism in America, especially where, well, you're not going to tell me what I do with my life and my Christianity. So it's, it, it's kind of an opposition to the way the church was, was established. And what I'm talking about is, um, when someone's caught in, caught in, in sin or, or sexual immorality and things like that. So talking about binding and loosing, we're taught that when another believer is caught in sin, what do we do? And, and Christians say this too. Well, you go to them first, right? Go to them first. He's sleeping with another woman. Go to him first. Address him. Um, if he doesn't listen, you go get somebody else, right? If that doesn't work, a group, and then if they're still not changing their sinful behavior within the church, they made that profession, they've, they've, they've given their lives to Jesus, baptized and all that, and they're still not repenting. They continue on in that horrible sin. There has to be some kind of disfellowship, right? And that's out of love. It's like this is so hopefully those consequences will, will bring you back because we we, we, we're representing a pure bride here. Is this okay? I mean, this, actually, I don't have to ask because I, I don't have to defend it. It's the church. And we've probably gotten away from this now because I don't want anybody in my private life. If I'm going to still sin like that, I'm going to do it. Well, is Jesus your Lord and Savior, though? But it's out of love, right? We're representing Jesus. So there's time for, times for rebuking immorality, or evil in a body of believers. Notice I'm saying believers, not the ones who are coming to hear the message, right? We don't require them to clean up first. They have to meet Jesus, and and he's going to help them change their lives. Which, by the way, in Matthew 18, that's where the two or three witnesses comes from. (laughs) And where two or three are gathered in my name, that's where I am in the midst of them. How many times have I used that wrong in my Christian walk? And you're at a prayer meeting, and... You get up and there's only a few of us. Oh, well, we're two or three are gathered. He's there in the midst of us. God's omnipresent. He was already here. That's in the context of the legal, the discipline, uh, a legal system. There had to be two or three witnesses to build an accusation against someone. That's all it has to do with. It never had to do with, because there's two of you here, somehow God's going to be more present with two. 
It's just not there. It, it, you have to read the whole chapter of Matthew 18. So my point is, these are, there's other spiritual warfare verses. There's a lot of them. If you want to do spiritual warfare, but this is not it. If you think that having the keys to the kingdom means, and binding and loosing means that I'm going to somehow use some kind of formula to bind demons and loose whatever. And I've had to correct this because I learned wrong to start. And now I'm here, I'm like, wow. So this isn't one of those verses. In fact, if you're an online person and you're searching for teachings online, this is what you'll see when you do a YouTube search for binding and loosing. Hallelujah, precious saints. Well, this very day, I'd like to pray prayers of binding and loosening. Hallelujah. Binding and loosing. I have the keys of the kingdom, and whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever I loose on earth is loosed in heaven. I bind the kings in chains and the nobles with fetters of iron. I bind Leviathan, and all proud spirits arrayed against my life. So these keys that you have right here of the kingdom open a portal through the first heaven, the second heaven, and into the third heaven for certain. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means read your Bible in context. You guys, you don't have any special keys to open up portals of heaven. That's never what it was about. Just read in context and you'll see it. All that glitters is not gold out there. And we have a mass of YouTube preachers and teachers and it's, it's just, it's robbing people of the real message of scripture. If you come to a hard verse, the first step is read the immediate context. Read what's before and after it. Then after that, you still don't get it, wider context. Then read the whole book. And there are difficult to understand verses, of course, but go to a church that preaches the entire word of God. Not based on human ideas. But isn't that the point? Isn't that why we're here? We're a church. We're a body, a community of believers, and we're taking the word seriously. That's what the church is for. Yes, worshiping too, but it's not all about music either. Because whether we have a modern worship or a cappella or just somebody singing on a banjo out of key, Jesus is still here. Even if there's one of us. People are going to get saved through the message of the kingdom. That's what the church is about. And that message is a confession by a community of believers. And we are a community. We are a community of believers. People from all different backgrounds. It's never individualism. It never was supposed to be individualism. I used to love individualism until God radically changed my heart. The idea that, the idea in our day that it's just, oh, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need church. I don't need to go in your church building. It's just, I, I have me and the Lord, and I'm okay. That's not the way the body of Christ functions. That's not the way Jesus built his church. And you can go read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 for that. How are we going to function without each other? Or better yet, and, and, I'll, and I'll close with this one, the church is really, why we're here, if you're wondering why we go to church, why we have to be involved in church, well, because... You know, it says somewhere in some verse in Hebrews. But, well, why? Why? Why is it not just about one person? Because the church, why we're here this morning 
were a result of what started when, when, when Peter started realizing and confessing Jesus as the Messiah, as the anointed one, the son of the living God, and what came after. Understa- he, un- he understood, he finally understood who Jesus is, and eventually he's proclaiming to the world, and that's just carried on to all of us. Why would we forsake what Jesus died and rose to assemble? Jesus died and rose to assemble us as his followers. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to, how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, day drawing near. So that, that confession, the, 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 on the rock, right? The, the firm foundation that it withstands rain and storms. It withstands, it overpowers, conquers the gates of hell. Death doesn't even, so what? Even if we die, it's not going to do anything. We win. So who do we say Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Church, we need to hold fast without wavering. There is every, every time we assemble, the, the great plan of the enemy in his mind is to, to break up this body. Now, he's already done a really good job, I guess, for now in his mind, if it is, if you could call it that, because we have a scattered and broken church, denominations and separate segregated buildings. That's, that's never how, it, that's not how it's going to be. Jesus, Jesus is coming for one bride. So it's, it can't just be you and Jesus just sitting in your house and having your me time with God. I'm not against that. I do that every morning. But we're a community. And that's why where we're going, I had to start here because we're going to get into some like serious forgiveness stuff and relationships with others. Well, I mean, we're in that that time now when we're leading to, it's going to amp up to Passion Week and all this, and it's called the, the Lent season. But this is what was happening. This is the context. Because it's not just you and Jesus, you're married to his bride also. You're united to his bride. You're in it with his bride. It's not just your Christian faith. And the bride doesn't always look pretty right now, right? She doesn't. But she's getting ready, isn't she? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? We're getting ready, we're purifying ourselves. All of us together. And then he comes back for one bride, purified, united. A purified church. So out of this, out of these verses comes the the, the big turning point. The second turning point in in Jesus' ministry. The first was in chapter 417. Matthew 417. From that time on, Jesus, Jesus began to preach and say... Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 21, from that time forth, Jesus began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. So the whole thing just shifts right here, and that's where we're going now. That's where we're following Jesus to. But we can't do that if this Christian thing is just for us alone. Jesus began to point to the cross, and that's where we're headed. And you're not in suffering alone, because it's, it's suffering, right? It's suffering. And I, 
I, I don't want to. I almost don't want to preach to you guys, hey, you had suffering coming. I want to tell you, hey, it's going to be okay. It's all going to be good. Well, yeah, it, it is because of where we're going. But you know that whatever suffering we'll walk through, we'll walk through together. And that's what the church is built for. It's the ultimate support group. It's the ultimate, yeah, it's the perfect, um, I don't even want to call it a self-help book. It's not. It's a, it's a self-sacrifice book. We get to learn from the one who sacrificed it all for us. So I know there are many this morning who are, you have a, you have a hard time with the church. You've, you've been hurt by the church. I don't know. I'm not going to like look at you and stare you down. I'm not thinking about you specifically. Or the church, maybe it's not what you want it to be. It's not what you expected. There's one thing. There's only one thing that matters as far as your expectation. And that's Jesus Christ and his coming back and returning. That's what matters. That's our expectation. It, it, it's, it's Jesus Christ. This whole, this, this American Christianity, in, in a sense, it, 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 it's, it's, it's helping us become lazy in our faith. And we have to come against that. Because we've, we've gotten comfortable, I think. So in a lot of ways, I'm not saying that I want this to happen, but we might need a little persecution to wake us up. Right? Have you ever thought about that? You don't want that, right? I know, I got my daughter. But do, do you honestly think those in China right now in the underground church who are like just pushing, pressing on in the midst of total, totalitarian evil regimes. They, they would die for their faith. Do you think that they really are arguing about the carpet color and the length of the service and the worship style? Think about it. I think that the blessing of suffering and persecution is that it does exactly what it's designed to do in the kingdom, and that's to draw us closer to Jesus. And that's where we're headed. And it's, it's awesome, and it's scary at the same time. It's scary because in our own strength, we can't do it. You're not in your own strength today. You have a body of believers here. You have a body. And it, it, it's not a perfect body, but, man, it's founded on something that's perfect. That's Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning?